I'm Liz hirschnoff tolly and welcome to the Capital Coffee Connection podcast. I'm really excited because today we have an amazing guest. Before we get to our talk and our coffee, um, I wanted just to give a little introduction of why we have this podcast. So many times people will say about a politician or an elected official, he's just a politician. It's just a, you know, a person like a cardboard cutout. And really what I have come to learn is that all of our elected leaders are really truly interesting people. They each have a different story and they are serving our, our country from their heart and wanting to make a difference. If you think about like the human genome, it basically the DNA of all people on earth, 8 billion plus, 99.6% are the same. And I think through this podcast, I'm looking to find out what the different 0.4% is, what separates people, and that what can actually bring us together. And when I was thinking about our guest today, I just want to tell a really quick story. So when my youngest son was going into second grade, um, the summer before the teacher and the principal, they pulled me into the office and they said, um, we think there's a problem. He's not reading. There might be something going on. And I said, okay, well, let me work on it over the summer. And during the summer, we read tons of little books that were hand-me-downs from his siblings. And I gave him these cute little eraser characters as like, yes, a consequence to reading. And when he started reading, when he came back to second grade, he was one of the top readers in his class. And the reason I tell this story is because our guest today, Congressman from Long Beach, Robert Garcia, came to America when he was five. And one of the ways that he learned to not only speak English, but to read was through comic books. And we're gonna talk about that. But I just thought that it's not a story that's unique in the sense that many little kids don't have it easy when it comes to a new language or to reading. And so I just thought that that was an interesting bond and we're gonna talk about your passion for comic books. Robert Garcia represents California's 42nd district, which people think of as Long Beach, mm -hmm. but it's also including Signal Hill, Lakewood, Bellflower, Downey, Bell Gardens, Commerce, Cudahy, Bell, Maywood, Vernon, Huntington Park, Walnut Park, Florence, Firestone. It's a little rap I do. Yes. Um, and he is the former mayor of Long Beach. Um, and he uh, is also the president of the Democratic freshman class in the U.S. Congress. So while we aren't gonna talk about politics and policy, uh, you've done a lot, you're an incredible leader, and I just wanna say thank you and welcome to our podcast, and thank you for having coffee so that we can uh, enjoy it today. And hey. I understand he has about three cups of coffee a day. <laughs> three cups of coffee, yeah. No, thank you, I'm happy, happy to be here, and I'm happy to, uh, to chat about any topic, and, um, and I do love coffee also. All right, well, cheers, cheers. and good morning. Thank you. Good, good afternoon and good evening, Absolutely. right? Just any time coffee. Um, so start with your parents. They immigrated when you were five years old from Lima, Peru. Yeah, I was a little younger than five, but oh, right, oh, I, was a, I was a young kid. And um, yeah, we all immigrated to the U.S. Um, and it was it was great at the time when I first arrived, um, just the experiences I was ex exposed to. And so my, it was it was me, my mom, my dad. Uh, my grandmother and then my aunt and my uncle have come just a few months before. Yeah. Um, and so we all were here. Uh, we landed here in the L.A. area, uh, kind of settled in the San Gabriel Valley um, and grew up in a very typical like immigrant experience. We um, didn't know any English. Uh, nobody came with English. Nobody came with English. I mean, wow. I, I, you know, I think my mom had a, you know taken an English class maybe in high school or yeah. something, but it, no one really knew the language. And. Um, immediately, you know, my, my aunt was cleaning houses. My mom was helping her. My mom got a job at a thrift shop. Uh, she pretty soon got a job at a clinic, kind of doing admin work. And um, we just grew up in a very typical Im immigrant experience in the San Gabriel Valley area. And um, I just feel very fortunate to have had such great examples of hardworking family mm -hmm. uh, and um, that encouraged me to, to do well in school. Um, like you said earlier, uh, I learned English by reading a lot of comics as a kid and going to like those old thrifties, you know, that you know, you get a scoop of ice cream and a comic book if you were if you did a good job in school. And um and then pretty soon I got older and I was the first in my family to go to college. And that's kinda how things yeah. happen. V a very first. typical for immigrants. Yeah. Yeah. And you also are a first and I'm gonna say this which openly LGBTQ 
foreign-born member of our Congress, which is impressive. And you're also the first immigrant and LGBTQ mayor of Long Beach. Yeah. You've done a lot of firsts. Um, and, you know, I think about people that are listening to this and really understanding, like, how hard it is to be a first. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it is really hard. I, I remember the, the first thing that really impacted me was being in college and not having anyone to, to lean on yeah. as to what to do. Because I we literally knew nobody that had gone to college. And so when I went to uh, Long Beach State, um, first I, I, I went to Long Beach State only because it was the university that was adjacent to the beach we'd go to every summer. Interesting. So we would drive from San Gabriel Valley to a beach called Mother's Beach in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. It's a small little beach. And the, and the only way to get to Mother's Beach is you have to pass by the university. Right. And so we'd pass by the university. Sometimes we would even like picnic on campus. Yeah. And then we'd go we'd go to Mother's Beach and we did it every summer. Um, and so when I applied to college, I it was like, oh, of course I was going to go to the only university I'd actually ever been to, which was Cal State Long Beach, right. which was by the beach we grew up in. So that's where I went. Um, I, uh, being, being at call, being in college and being the first was hard. I mean, I was not documented at the time, so I did not have citizenship. I didn't get citizenship until I was out of college, leaving college is when I, when, when I got my citizenship. So it's, it's hard. That's it, a lot of years. It's a lot of years, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and I think that level of commitment to breaking that barrier for my family is what kind of made me a little bit. Um, intentional and really fearless about any other barriers that maybe were in front of me in the future. That's a good story. Do you think back to any experience in elementary, high school, college, a teacher that stood out as someone that inspired you or, or helped you that you really think about still to this day in your life? You know, I have a, when I got to college, um, there was a professor, uh, his uh, name is Dr. Smith, that um, was clearly uh, was clearly gay, and he he mentioned he talked about it. He was open about it. He was the first real kind of gay person I really knew in a way that was affirming. Yes. And so we became you know he was a mentor. To this day we're friends. We've been he's been a mentor and a, and a advisor. He was the one that always would write me a letter of recommendation for work, and so he kind of took me under his wing. A lot of respect for him. And so he really made an impact for me in college. And mm -hmm. when I was um, in college and I started getting involved in leadership, I, you know, he, he helped me, he kind of helped, got me engaged in like student government. And then I ran for student body president uh, and I won. And you became the first, uh, you know, first to go to college. And then all of a sudden you were in the president of and, the college. And I think what's crazy about that is no one knew at the time that they were voting for someone that wasn't a U.S. citizen. Yeah. And I mean, I, you, you wouldn't certainly would not be allowed to vote for me in any other election except for an election on campus that doesn't you know, check your, your citizenship status. Yeah. So I, I won. Uh, I got elected student body president. And then um, and then I got elected uh, president of the student body president council in California. Mm -hmm. So I was able to represent other student body presidents and student governments at, in Sacramento at the state level. Right. And then when I did that. I got a kind of a taste of what like legislate legis you know, legislative advocacy was like, um, and then from there you know it's just things that started happening and I got a little involved and figured myself out and um, and here we are. And then you became a mayor, which isn't just figuring yourself out. I mean that's a pretty big responsibility. Um, how did how did like you go from where you were to deciding I'm going to run for mayor? Well, by then, by the time, you know, when I was, you know, I'd, I'd become a U.S. citizen, I got involved in some politics, I became an educator, so I, I went to grad school, um, uh, had a lot more choice at that point because I knew what I was doing, you know. Yeah. Um, I went to, to, to USC, had a great experience in grad school, I went back on my doctorate. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. I, I taught in the, both in the classroom and became a college administrator, pretty young, and and then I, w I just had an had an inkling that I could do the kind of political legislative work uh, as, an, as, as someone that could represent the community because I was so involved in the community. Yeah. And so I ran for city council. When I got elected to the council in Long Beach, at the time I was the youngest person ever elected to the city council. First, you know, uh, certainly openly gay Latino, uh, youngest person. So I kind of was breaking barriers there, which was fine. And then immediately after that, 
I, my mayor did said not to run for re-election for the last for the last term. I had only been on the council. It was I was still in my first term, and so everybody was like, "Well, there's no way you're going to run for mayor because you're only you know 32 years old." And, <laughs> uh, and everyone that was going to run for mayor yeah. was like seasoned legislators, like a member of the state assembly, longtime council people. What gave you the confidence to do it? You know, I've, I'm a pretty fearless person. I have never been somebody that feels constrained by my circumstance. Or what people say is what's supposed to be. Or what's supposed to be. Yeah. I, I've never been a person that kind of falls into that. And so when I looked at the when I looked at the position, like Long Beach is a huge city. People don't realize it. It's bigger than Cincinnati, St. Louis, Miami, New Orleans. Yeah. It's a huge city. It's half a million people. It's big. And so when I was looking at this, and it's the same size as Atlanta, Georgia. I tell people all the time. So when I was when I was looking at this at the at the opportunity in the seat, I knew that the, the community wanted kind of like a fresh new perspective interesting and so i just i put myself forward right no one thought i was gonna win i outworked everybody and i got elected and i became the you know youngest person first latino first gay person the whole thing and and um and then once i got elected mayor i served for mayor for eight years and then i got elected to congress yeah and i and we're again we're not talking politics but i also find it very interesting that you originally were registered as a Republican. Yep. And then, and, and it's not a matter of what switched you, but then you became a Democrat and you understand like that there is a need for both parties to be strong and existing in our country. Absolutely. And you know, I, I love this story because I think it's so, it, it's so interesting about the immigrant experience. So when I immigrated to, when I, when we were here, um, we, I'm a U.S. citizen because of Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan signed the 1980s amnesty bill the last actual piece of legislation that gave immigrants a pathway to citizenship. Right. So when my family, I remember when my family and I became citizens, and I remember being at the huge, at the fairgrounds, and I just became a U.S. citizen. Right. I walk out, and there's this huge picture, or it's like Standy cut out of Ronald Reagan. My family loved Ronald Reagan. And um, and so we all became Republicans. Not just me, but everyone in my family. Yeah. And uh, and then, you know, time, time moves forward, and then you kind of figure yourself out. And, in, and for myself, it was you know, realizing I was gay, what my values were, and you make other choices. And obviously, um, been, a, been a proud Democrat for a long time. Uh, and But I don't fault, like a lot of folks, I certainly we all have our issues, and I, I do with other folks, and, and that, I, that I find is extreme on occasion. But I, I there are good people in every party. Absolutely. And, and I think that it's important not to Everyone reaches why they are in their party for different reasons, so I very much, you know, understand that, and I, yeah. I and my family understands that, and we all went through our own process of figuring out who we were, and it just so happens that we all eventually became Democrats. Right, that's kind of the beauty of our country. Absolutely. Yeah, talk a little bit about family. So I, I'm, I I know that your mother passed away during um, the last few years mm -hmm. from COVID, yep. and your stepfather passed away. Yep. And I also know that you and your mom were very close. Yep. And I, I don't want to bring this to a negative or a sad piece, but like, how has your life transitioned? Because if you had this woman who was your supporter, that rock when you first came to yep. America, and seeing her, you know, pass so early, how have you been able to like kind of rationalize, deal with it, and 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 accept it? Well, I mean, it's yeah. I mean, it's, it's been uh, it's been three years. And, and honestly, I, I was just reminded of that from my brother, who said, you know, you realize it's been three years. I'm like, wow. I'm like, it just, it does not, it does not feel that way. I feel like it just happened. Uh, I was very close to my mom. Um, and she was a healthcare worker. And prior to the vaccine, to the vaccine being available, and I was mayor of Long Beach. Yeah. We had just closed everything down. It was the height of the pandemic. It was literally a nightmare. Just my job as mayor, as you can imagine. And then my, you know, my mom got, got COVID. And then my stepdad got COVID. And so they both ended up getting COVID one, one after the other. And then within, um, you know, within just, they passed away within two weeks of each other. It was 15 days, 14, 15 days. So my mom passed away and then my stepdad passed away. And it was devastating, not just for me, for my brother. I mean, my stepdad, you know, was an incredible, incredible person. My brother lost both parents. 
So it was really, really hard. And I, um, I think like that was a very like traumatic time. Yeah. But it also like strengthened my resolve to do the right thing. Yeah. So I think, you know, she left me a lot of strong values and traits around honesty and hard work and mm -hmm. truth and justice. And the one thing that she really left me uh, as she passed was uh, to, 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 to kind of reinforce this idea of uh, doing the right thing, like regardless of the outside pressure, yeah. uh, which I did during the pandemic. And, 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 and this idea to focus on, on science and truth and supporting our, our medical community. She was a healthcare worker. She was a nurse's assistant. She talked about the, the virus and the pandemic in really important ways. And she left me with that. And she, I grew up in hospitals and clinics. Yeah. And so part of the reason why Governor Newsom called our response in Long Beach the best response in the state of California, part of the reasons why President Biden singled out the city of Long Beach as a national model in pandemic response is because of the work of my mom and bringing me around so, so many healthcare professionals. It's beautiful. So it's her legacy. Part Absolutely. Of her, part of her legacy, Absolutely. but a beautiful part. Uh, you are married. Yes. And how is it to be married and be someone now who is half of the time in D.C.? I mean, I, I don't want to dig into being too personal, but sure, sure. you have to have a pretty special partner, husband, to be able to work on that. How does that go? Yeah, I mean, I think. Look, I think first you, know, you were we're still learning how to make it how to make it work. It's very hard to be. Yeah, you're new to this. New, I you know, but it's you know the good thing is is like. Uh, he's a very strong, independent, progressive person on his own. And so we were both, um, he's a professor, he's an academic, he's a political scientist, so he kind of gets the business. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, and so I think you, I think everyone in D.C. that I've talked to um, that's married uh, figures it out. You know, you, 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 you go from being with your partner every day at least I was. Right. Well, that's how most do, too. Like, yeah. not seeing them four or five days a week. Yeah. And actually, sometimes not seeing them for right. two weeks exactly. if you are in a short weekend, yeah. you know? And so um, so it's, it is it is a hard adjustment. But I think that, that you, you you figure it out. You know, I think that, um, you know, Matt's an incredibly uh, smart, talented um, person. And the, the spouses that I have met, particularly like the freshmen, yeah. they're all great people and they're all just trying to figure the best way forward. But it is the one thing I, I mean, I really wish that we'd be able to be home more even, yeah. but um, I think it's harder for Californians. Yes. And it, and it, and it, I think about like, I have a colleague from Hawaii who's a freshman. I'm going, oh man, if you think it's bad for us on the West Coast, I think about her all the time too. That's five more hours. Yeah, I, right. <laughs> and I, I am very envious of my colleagues that live in Maryland and Virginia. Yeah, just the Acela to home. Yeah, yeah. Or, or even New They're York. home for dinner. Absolutely. I, I always ask later on the hobby, but you have a specific hobby which goes back to this comic book story that we started with. Yeah. And I understand that's how you started to read and really got interested in, and you also learned a language. Yep. Um, but you've carried this further. Like you're really like a comic book fan. Super, yep. Talk a little bit about that because you're not unique. There's millions of comic book fans. Yeah, and I, not just that, but if you look at like Hollywood today, yeah, the the single largest IP and the most successful content in the world is derived from comic books, right? And so it's not like some outside thing. It's just that everyone just happens to be discovering it in the last decade, you know. And so I think that for me, I got hooked when I was a kid. The stories kind of spoke to me. I think that there is, and I've talked to a lot of other people about this particularly like there's a large LGBTQ fan base within like the comic space. And a lot of it is because you are relating to these kind of heroes that have like secret identities that are always having to hide their true self yet can be heroic. And I think that spoke to me as a kid. Mm -hmm. And like, I've always, people always say, why are you such a big Superman fan? And I always say, well, you know, he's a strange, a uh, person, immigrant from another planet that's coming to to another place that's foreign to, to him. Then he has to hide his real identity. Right. So it, it really like hit me exactly. I'm like, oh, this is me. I'm from a different place. I I have to hide my identity. Uh, and so 
I think those. I think the stories speak to, to, to folks. That's interesting. But then broader. I mean, the more br- the the broader thing is, and I don't think people realize this is that American. If you think of like American fiction mm-hmm. and just an, and um, American mythology, the like superhero like myth, whether it's the characters that we've created, these are American creations. It's our single largest export of American fiction, and um, and any type of uh, um, kind of IP that we have is, has been these stories of these creations that we created here, and they're and they're very popular. And now they produce the biggest box office, you know, blockbusters. And so I'm, I I still read comics to this day. They're good stories. I tell people I'm a great reader because I read comics so much. Yeah. I I read an enormous amount every single day. Most of it is news or you know or is it nonfiction right but every once in a while it's good to pick up something that's you know it's yeah. untrue <laughs> <laughs> it is untrue but yet it's something that f- f- fulfills you absolutely um so uh now we're going to switch to the part where i'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions that are more to get to know you and likes and dislikes and um you can answer with a one word or you can sure. elaborate um worst advice you ever received best advice Oh, worst advice I ever received. Um, I mean, I, th- I think I think the worst advice I ever I've I've always ever received is when people have told me, uh, "Don't run because you're too young." Mm-hmm. Like that's that was the worst advice I received when I ran for council, and the worst advice I received when I ran for mayor. Right. And it was terrible advice. I didn't listen to it. That's the worst advice I've ever received. You're too young. People that say you're too whatever, I think is the, you you, you should you shouldn't put those kind of barriers in front of people. I mean, the best advice I've received uh, was has always been from like my, my mom, my grandmother, who kind of passed on, is that the best way of getting something done is to be kind and nice to people. Mm-hmm. That's the best advice I received. I am I'm very like uh, even I think if, like with my with people that I know or even like my team, like you know, I can be like anybody. I could certainly have expectations of folks, yes. but I'm pretty nice. Like I, I'm not a yeller. I don't yell. I'm very even keeled. I don't like um, it. Is it would be very hard for me to like raise my voice at somebody and yeah. and yell because I I just it's not like in me to do it. Yeah. Uh, but but I try to be really kind and nice to everyone, and I feel like that's gotten me, you know, pe- people being nice in return. Yeah, I think I think those are true words for pretty much everybody. If you're yeah. kind and nice, you actually will have a better chance, and you'll feel better. Yep, exactly. Um, one question I ask most people, and I and I think you'll, I know your answer, but I'm still going to ask it because I think, who is who is your biggest cheerleader? Well, my biggest cheerleader growing up with my mom, of course. Yes. I mean, 100 uh, percent has always been um, uh, my mom. So, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think I think that she in my life has been my biggest cheerleader from when yeah. I was a kid. Yep. Yeah, it's nice. If you could have one meal, your favorite meal, what would that be? I mean, that if I could have one meal, yeah, it would probably, putting the pressure on you, it, put, it would probably be a um, a a cheese cheese and bacon and avocado burger, yeah, uh, with the bacon extra crispy, yeah, and French fries. And were the French fries extra crispy too? Uh, I, I'm I actually, I'm like um, I have a wide variety of French fry tastes, so. Mm-hmm. I can go from the very crispy to the softer French fry. Okay, good. Uh, curly fries. Yeah, it's all um, good to know. Uh, but I think a good, a good like hamburger with cheese and avocado and bacon and fries would be my last meal if I ever. That's a pretty good one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, favorite music. Hip hop. That's it. One word answer. I, I like mean, it. yeah, hip hop and rap. Yeah. Yep. And um, if he, if you have to do one household chore, what is your favorite household I, chore? I uh, I absolutely love doing laundry. That's funny. Me yeah. too. I love doing, and it's so therapeutic, and I love doing laundry. In fact, I sometimes have to stop myself from doing laundry <laughs> when there's not enough of a of like yeah, a, a load, load to, to do. do. Yeah, yeah. I, hear I you. love doing laundry. Yeah. Okay. Um, where would you go in the world that you've never been, but you would love to go to? So I, let me just first say that I am very fortunate that I've been to um, – I've had the chance to go to a lot of places in my role as mayor because of our port. And so I yes. feel like a lot of the places that you know um, I wanted to go to, I've, I've, I've been to. But the one place that I have not been to that I want to go to is, is, is Antarctica. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which is maybe there. not on the top of the list for a lot of folks, no. but I really want to go there. I think there. it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to get there soon. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, is there a quote or a mantra you live by? I know we talked about kindness, but is there somebody's quote that, you know, runs in your brain? Yes. Do the most good by Hillary Clinton. Do the most good. Yep. I think that's great. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it's not hard to remember. Not hard to remember. You in know, fact, I have that quote on a on a sign that um, I took back from the convention when we nominated her. Right. Uh, Democrats nominated her that I have and took my favorite sign. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, rough days. What keeps you going? Like, where do you find um, I the, your mojo, the power to just go, I can get through this? I, I actually think that this is like one of like my superpowers like, you know, people say what their superpowers are. Yes, yeah, Superman. Yeah, yeah. I, I, might, I always felt like my superpower is I'm, I can take an enormous amount of incoming stress or pain and not be flustered by it. And I just, I just, it comes at me and it's come at me in a variety of ways. And I'm able just to process it. Right. And I think what allows me to process it is I always remind myself that the problem. The, the problem or the thing I'm worried about um, probably doesn't matter as much to other folks as it matters to me. It's a and good in one. my head, I, you know, you, I think a lot of time we, we put so much stress on how other people are going to interpret what we're going through and it's not their problem. And like, the, you know, it might bother them for like a minute and then they move on to their problems. Right. And you're still stuck. And with we're it. stuck with yeah. it. So just yeah. let, a le don't like, don't. That's no, a good point. Yeah. And yeah. I don't, I'm not a grudge holder either at all like you can do something really bad or upset me and i typically just move on yeah not always but typically i move on and, and so i try to I, I i think that just not allowing things to bother me helps you to do it yeah yeah okay so now we're gonna do a really quick little game which is called kiss mary trash kiss you may mary have heard trash. it as other names yeah, I have. so i'm gonna give you three pieces three kiss things mary Trash. We're doing kiss, marry, what you'd kiss, what you would marry, what you would trash. Okay. Trash is nicer than the other ways. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of a PG version. Trash, yeah. And it's just like a fun way to get to know on a few things, and they're really easy. Okay. Um, summer, fall, winter. Uh, fall. Okay. Summer, fall, summer, summer, fall, or winter. Yeah. Summer is definitely trash. Uh, uh, sp um, did you say did fall, you say, winter? F oh, fall is. Um, but what's the most what's Mary. The, is Mary is, no 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 the one I want to marry is winter. Okay, so you're gonna marry winter. I'm gonna marry winter. Kiss fall. I'm gonna kiss fall and I'm gonna trash summer. Okay, now you got the whole point. Okay, yeah, we're gonna it, go. Yeah, yeah. Um, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Oh, breakfast, Mary. Okay. Uh, then uh, lunch would definitely be um, kiss. Okay. And I'm definitely gonna trash dinner. Okay. Um, if you were gonna relax, Netflix, reading, meditating. Ooh, uh, if I was gonna relax. Uh, reading would be um, Mary. Uh, I would absolutely then um, kiss Netflix, and I would trash meditating. Okay. Um, if you and I don't meditate, it's like uh, not my for me. It's not I understand. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, it, food groups: Mexican, Japanese, Italian. <sighs> That's tough. Um, I would probably marry Mexican. Um, Oh man, I, I would marry Mexican, I would kiss a J Japanese, and I would kill Italian. Okay. Or, or not kill. Yeah, I'd trash, trash it. Italian, yeah. Um, if you're gonna watch movies, comedy, romantic, thriller. I would. I uh, didn't put in the. Yeah. You know. Oh no, no, thriller. I would. I would absolutely um, marry thriller, and I would. Uh, um, I would probably then do comedy as the kiss, and then I would probably trash uh, the rom-com okay. or the romance. Yeah. Um, this goes back to you. I mean, you just did throw out the pot, the Italian, yeah. but I love this question because it tells a lot about people. Pasta types: fusilli, penne, spaghetti. Spaghetti. So spaghetti. Well, spaghetti I would marry. Okay. But first of all, I love Italian food. I know. So but just you had to, to throw back, out something. I, had to I throw know something it's all back. relative. I'm like, oh, you picked all yeah. my favorite food. So um, <laughs> I love. Uh, so I would spaghetti. And then I would definitely um, uh, kiss penne. Okay. And trash the fusilli. Yeah, trash fusilli. Yeah. I, mean, I like fusilli too, but yeah, I'm kind of with you on that one. Yeah. Um, sports: basketball, baseball, football. Uh, I would probably marry football. I would probably um, uh, kiss baseball, and then I would probably trash basketball. Okay. 
Uh, you don't have any major league teams in Long Beach. No, but uh, the only reason why I said football we don't is because I, well, I, I besides like being an SC fan and, and, and following football when I was in, in college football, I was actually like my high school, I was in the high school band ah. and I was in the marching band and I was also the high school like drum major. And so we played every football game and people don't realize this, but like high school drum majors are experts at football because you have to know every single like the plays, the game, you know, how long you have uh, to play to play songs. And so I just always, I always felt like football was the thing I just knew the best. I never, that's, I didn't know what that role was. So that's good. So this is where we end, but I have one last question that I ask everybody. Sure. And my question is, what is your definition or what does joy mean to you? Mm -hmm. What brings you joy? And then how through feeling joyful or through what you get to do, are you able to spread joy? I mean, I think joy to me is, I think that, I think joy is that you, there are different types of joy I right. first. And so I think that like the joy you feel with a partner or family can be different than the joy you feel with like friends. And I think that the both are different types of happiness and joy. And I, and I think it's really healthy to have both. I think sometimes, um, uh, for me, I for me to be really a joyful person, I need quality time with both family, partnership, but also with like friends and fun, um, and uh, and just being you know yeah. f free. And so uh, I that that for me is 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 euphoria is being able to enjoy all types of pe all types of your real extended family. Um, that brings me the most joy. I mean, for me, I'm the most joyful when. I am, you know, with family or friends, and we're just enjoying and talking and um, it's sharing each other's company. Yeah, I think it's the most important thing. It is, and it's weird because like joy for me has never had anything to do with work. I, and I, I mean, I, I mean, being in Congress is a huge honor, and it's a very important job. But I don't know that it's joyful, so it's not like I am. You know, it's not a. It's joyful to help people. Yes. And it's joyful to, I don't know that, and, and joy is maybe not the right word. I think I think a job like Congress is 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 more, I feel more like a sense of responsibility okay. and more like a sense of like justice and to, 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 to right wrongs, which is not always joyful. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing. And you really have an amazing story. And, you know, whether it's that of, in a lot of ways, a Superman, um, or it's just a, a, a son, an immigrant child. Um, I, I think your story has so many dimensions that I'm looking forward to people being able to get to actually know who this guy is from a pretty cool city, Long Beach, yeah. and who is a freshman and really um, doing all that he can to make a difference in, um, in our government, so in our country. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, it's Liz. Please join me every Tuesday for coffee to talk about heart and humanity with our elected leaders. Ciao.